Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome to Next. Welcome to our session on how to use Vertex AI and its generative capabilities to accelerate your projects. We're super excited to have you here. I'm Jason. I manage several of our AI projects here at Google Cloud, and I'm here with Eric. He's the vice president of data science at Estee Lauder. We've got a packed agenda for today's session. We're gonna start with an overview of Vertex and where it fits into our suite of products, including all of our newly released generative AI capabilities. Then Eric will tell you about how Estee Lauder works with Vertex to deliver AI-enabled solutions for business stakeholders. We'll come back to me for some demos and a deeper dive into some of our most exciting new products, including Vertex's model garden. We'll talk about how it's a starting point for your AI journeys. And then we'll save some time for Q&A at the end. Let's get right into it. So Google Cloud provides customers with a complete set of capabilities and solutions. This is a diagram of our technology stack. If you look starting at the bottom, we have some of the world's best and most differentiated infrastructure including our TPU, which has a very compelling price performance ratio. We also run GPU, as many of you saw uh, from, the, from the keynote that just finished with, uh, with NVIDIA as well. One step up, and we'll come back to this in a lot more detail, is our model garden, where we offer open source, Google first party, and third party models. This is the starting point for your AI journeys. It contains a curated set of many of the models we use for solutions up the stack as well. This year, we've extended the capabilities of our AI platform, which has traditionally been known as Vertex. For training and hosting models, we now have tuning, distilling, evaluating your models. We also have extensions and connectors. And then we'll come back to this as well for, for a brief second around grounding later on. A lot of these are new announcements this week, and I encourage you to join the breakout sessions that are gonna dive into each of these in detail. As we move further up, we have capabilities for search and conversational AI. Some of our agents, so our AI solutions, provide solutions out of the box for things like document understanding, financial risk tooling, like anti-money laundering tooling, and also conversational interactions. We've integrated responsible AI tooling up and down the stack as well. So each one of these products come with built-in responsible AI tooling. And we're also proud to work with our partners to deliver solutions across our entire ecosystem. I'd love to introduce Eric to come talk about Estee Lauder's journey. Oh, that's the wrong direction. Great start. Um, all right. Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Higgins, and um, I'm here to talk about. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm here to out here to talk about how the Estee Lauder companies um, is using Google Cloud in order to delight its con uh, consumers in the um, in the luxury beauty space. <clears throat> Now, most of you, a bit of a business perspective. Most of you are probably familiar uh, with Estee Lauder, but many of you are probably not familiar with all the brands that are under the Estee Lauder umbrella. Um, so here's a little list of them here. Um, the Estee Lauder companies are a collection of brands that span cosmetics, fragrance, skin, and uh, health, hair care. And these, all of these brands have a unique value proposition and voice. Uh, each has a, a each is distinct in their own way, and that distinction is essential to the luxury experience that each one of these brands delivers. Now, 
our brands don't exist in a vacuum, and much like the companies that y'all represent, um, we face fierce competition in the marketplace. Many of the challenges uh, that are many of the challenges that we face are on the grounds of the, the experiences that we drive with our consumers. Things like um, clientele, um, online and digital ex digital experiences, omnichannel convenience, and of course, keeping up with um, the ever-changing trends in the beauty industry as well as the fashion industry. Success on these fronts means demonstrating excellence not only in commercial activities, but in operations efficiency, but also in the creative dis disciplines through which we express and establish our brand identity. So, pretty simple stuff overall. Now, the Estee Lauder Company has a set of guiding principles, which actually connect pretty well to the establishment of a data science organization. And, uh, you know, these, I think, translate well both in terms of the goals that we are trying to achieve as well as the or responsible development of the practices that we are trying to drive. It's under these circumstances that the, a new data science team was formed in 2021, uh, about the same time that Vertex AI was getting launched. So we were kind of co-evolving along with Vertex AI. This is when I joined the company. And I joined to start a new data science team in the equally new digital technology and experience group at Estee Lauder. Uh, the team was to have a global remit across all brands and uh, you know, across all brands with a mission to deliver uh, results oriented data science and analytic solutions. <clears throat> Now, succeeding in that mission demanded, among other things, uh, flexibility. Uh, all of these diverse brands operated in diverse um, regions around the world, and they assumed equally diverse technical approaches. So flexibility was sort of necessary in order to make sure that our solutions were generalizable. Fortunately, um, we were given the opportunity to actually build a new data science platform from the ground up. And doubly fortunately, we were able to have an exceptionally talented machine learning leader join our team by the name of Chris Currow, um, who actually had the foresight to reinforce a system of, a, a culture of DevOps discipline throughout everything that we did. Um, and he, he was able to maintain this uh, from the very beginning until now, and I cannot overstate the importance of this DevOps discipline in developing machine learning opportunities and how much has been able to drive what we're doing and how much of that was actually enabled by Vertex AI and Google Cloud Tools. So this is uh, the par a part of the development philosophy that Chris helped us reinforce. Um, actually, in the interest of time, I'm not going to read the whole thing. But um, it, this is important because this actually guides all of our development. And th it is actually empowered by all of the services that we're able to draw from Google Cloud. It has allowed us to adhere to these principles and develop in a way that was ultimately scalable and reaching that goal of generalizability. Now, in the beginning, this meant using open source platforms in order to uh, maintain that flexibility that we need to operate with all of our dis diff different business units. We were using open source tools like Kubeflow pipelines um, <clears throat> to build and manage workflows and promote, a you know, and we promoted rigorous systems of review and processes in order to make sure that we were sticking to that discipline that we set out to achieve. Uh, GCP was our preferred platform, and we progressively used more GCP services as we went along. Uh, and again, this, my, this team that I'm talking about started out at the same time that Vertex AI was launched, so we kind of were progressively integrating more and more into our system of uh, Vertex AI solutions um, as time went on, and we were building out new solutions. Now, some of the earliest um, wins that we had were in A-B testing frameworks, uh, where, we were, where our teams were able to develop um, and deploy variant reduction methods that actually reduce costs and increase the speed at which we could run tests. Uh, we were also able to deliver advanced recommendation systems to Estee Lauder, something that I'll be revisiting a little bit later, as well as consumer lifetime value models and expanded customer segmentation. Now, these last two, in combination with the A-B testing, allowed us to 
deliver cost savings early on to the SA Lauder companies, as well as um, increasing spend efficiency for a lot of our marketing activities. This helped um, justify the existence of my team by delivering a lot of these early results, and over time gave us the clout to um, well, generate a lot more demand from inside the company to explore other capabilities um, using um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now, Vertex AI was a key element of this. We were using more and more of these, these services in, so that we could spend less time worrying about infrastructure and more time thinking about the data science solutions we wanted to build and how we were gonna be driving business value. And a key element of this was our development partner, Eviden, um, who we were able to lean on for staff augmentation. They were able to help us scale resources as necessary as a Google partner, but they were also bringing in, as a as, as uh, an organization that's familiar with Google Cloud products, essential knowledge that actually furthered our journey in data engineering, analytics, as well as a lot of our machine learning efforts. So here's an architecture diagram of uh, where we, we are landing now. Now Vertex AI plays a central role in all of this um, in order to kind of keep things simple for us. And again, keep us focused on a lot of the, uh, the business deliverables that are driving what we're doing. Um, on top of that, we also, BigQuery, it plays a very big part in all of our analytics initiatives. A lot of our BI and total data infrastructure is built on BigQuery. And of course we use things like uh, Google Artifact Registry um, because it integrates well with Google Cloud tools as well as a lot of our CI CD tooling, um, and that helps us automate a lot of our pipelines. So a little bit more about those use cases. So Estee Lauder, um, one of the most important experiences that we have on our websites is personalization and recommendations are a big part of that. So Vertex AI provided us access to new recommendation tooling systems that are allowing us to deliver new ways of actually delivering personalized experiences on our websites. So over time, we are gonna be deploying more and more of these to our brand.com brand sites uh, to give consumers an increasingly uh, more personalized experience um, and how they experience our brands and our products. <clears throat> More recently, um, we've been able to explore more uses in generative AI, which I know is something that's very interesting to a lot of people here. But this actually was not a new area for us. Uh, that guy I mentioned before, Chris Curro, actually back in the middle of 2022, he led a small team, including an intern, to use an LLM to actually um, help us get a better handle on uh, our, customer ca our customer call logs in order to actually uh, more accurately label the reason why people were calling, um, and this allowed us to identify issues faster and ultimately act on them faster so that we can um, create a more seamless and improved experience for a lot of our consumers. After that, we expanded on these use cases and started looking at um, ways in which we could actually pr uh, produce um, reviews digest, so people provide us feedback on our sites and feedback on our products, and these come in in large volumes. It's very difficult for our business stakeholders to actually go through all of these and figure out what to do. So LLMs have allowed us to summarize these quickly, which helps our business take, you know, our, the people on the business side identify the issues, act on them quickly, and again, deliver a more delightful experience uh, for our consumers and make it so that these types of issues don't continue to pervade. We've also started looking at how LLMs can actually accelerate a lot of our creative workflows and uh, workflows and copy-related activities, uh, primarily through variant generation. Uh, these copy variants may be, you know, may be used to substantially reduce the time and turnaround time associated with a lot of our marketing and strategy activities. Again, freeing up time for a lot of people on, on uh, who work on those work streams. Um, the examples here were actually chose to be completely inane, so if you're wondering why, why is Estee Lauder to, you know, want to change the copy variant to be a little bit more sinister, that's just my team having fun and it's something I can put up here without being you know, too risky. <clears throat> and of course, more efficient and accessible ML, uh, more efficient and accessible ML environment um, has given a bump to a lot of our commercial data science activities, allowing us to deliver and iterate faster. Um, so overall, we're continuing to improve efficiency the more we lean on these frameworks. So all the while, Vertex AI has continued to evolve and we're actually integrating more and more into the way that we do our work. And it's actually creating new ways for the, all the people across my team to interact with Vertex AI uh, 
both through our normal MLOps environment, but also through some of the no-code and uh, no-code capabilities are coming up on the platform itself. And with that, hand it back over uh, to Jason to talk more about Model Garden. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. That was really exciting. It's it's amazing to see how quickly you drove business value right from the bet and. Well, we often see a lot of our customers, you get a big win to start with, and you can, you can get a lot of rope for your team to explore, and that's, that exploration really drives the, the future of companies. And so we're, we're seeing that all over. So it's actually one of the really cool things about our foundation models. They, they work for a lot of use cases right out of the box, and then they evolve over time as you get more and more creative. Speaking of which, I'd like to talk a little bit about our model garden. So, the Model Garden is our opinionated take on the best and most relevant Google, open source, and partner models. We've integrated all of these models with Vertex's powerful tooling so you can get started in seconds. We'll show you some demos in a little bit. We enable end-to-end -end journeys where you can find the perfect model for your task, tune it for your own needs, and then deploy to a custom endpoint, all in a few clicks. Our collection of models includes a broad array of large foundation models and a wide variety of more task-specific ones. Model Garden's a great place to compare whether you want to start building from an API or work from one of our up-the-stack solutions that I talked about before. And of course, the MLApps tooling that Eric talked about before integrates with all of these models as well. So you don't need a separate starting point for generative AI foundation models that you would for any other ML model. It's all integrated. So what are you going to find in Model Garden? We have 40 foundation models, like Google's Palm 2 and Imogen. And we have 60 open source models. And these numbers are growing every time we do another release. So we started a few months ago, and we're up 30% from 70 total to over 100 total now. We are committed to providing our customers with choice. While we're very proud of Google's 1P, our own foundation models, we're also committed to providing our customers with the choice for the best models for your workload. And we still want to have that be seamlessly integrated into Vertex. Google's been working on AI for quite a while now. So we have some task-specific models that we've also developed, and those are available in Model Garden. Things like optical character recognition, Google created a very good OCR algorithm when we scan the world's books, and we make that available to our customers. We've been working on it consistently since then. Uh, sentiment analysis and then translation, things like it's the, it's the algorithm that powers the, the free product Google Translate as well. So these are some really powerful world-class models that you might not think about in the, same, in the same thought process as you think about something like Palm 2, but sometimes these models are the right choice for you, and so we're committed to giving you that choice. These models work across a range of modalities like text, speech, embeddings, images, documents, and more. One key point here is that we think of documents as their own modality. Documents have text and images and layout, and so as we move over time into a more multimodal world, inputs like documents are just going to be thought of as another input format that's distinct from things like text and images and speech. So what's new today? For those of you who are watching the keynote, some of these were, uh, were mentioned earlier. We have 20 new OSS models. So we've been working quite, quite hard on, on bringing the best to Model Garden. So you'll hear about the upgrades to our foundation models in the other sessions uh, this week, so I'm not gonna dwell on, on the Google first party models too much. Let's talk a little bit more about the OSS models and then our partner models as well. So uh, as, as Thomas mentioned in the keynote, we've integrated several of Meta's uh, models into our model garden. So Llama 2 is now fully integrated and, and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail later. We'll show you, I'll show you a little bit more of an example. We've also integrated Meta's code models, so Code Llama. Those were released uh, late last week, so about 48 business hours later, we've got them up and running in Model Garden. So we are committed 
to being at the cutting edge of the best open source model releases. This week, as mentioned about an hour ago, we are also pre-announcing Claude 2, Anthropics model, as a pre-announcement for it will soon be available and integrated into our model garden. So we offer first party, open source, and partner models all in one place, all integrated with Vertex's tooling. One thing that is particularly, uh, it's a decision that we made is that we are not just providing for the vast, vast majority of these models, we're not just providing a link to a repo somewhere as an open source model. That integration, things like responsible AI tooling, things like uh, there's bias evaluation tooling, and then just pure model evaluation, comparing the results of one model versus another model. That kind of tooling and integration with all of our existing ML ops tooling, that kind of tooling comes out of the box with Model Garden. Let's go into some use case deep dives, and for here, we're gonna do a demo. So I will let the team switch over and turn my computer on. There we go. So as, as my colleague mentioned earlier this morning, we'll see how live demos go. You know it's live if something goes wrong. So here you can see this is the, the opening screen for Model Garden when you click on Model Garden in our cloud console. I would expect that most of you who are developing tooling for your enterprises would be building your own applications to deploy. Many of your business users won't necessarily be coming to the Google Cloud Console. For the purposes of demonstrating here, I wanted to give you all the, the very bleeding edge look at what we're doing. So, as Eric mentioned, one of his use cases is around marketing. So we're seeing a lot of marketing teams generate content. And a lot of it is fixing the blank page problem, right? You show up at the beginning of the day and I wanna think of four or five different options. I Write me copy for each, and let's go talk about it, edit it, see which one the best one is, but let's get started. It's Generative AI is really amazing for those types of use cases. Today, let's use Vertex to generate inspiration for a blog post for a healthy snack product line at a consumer packaged goods company. So we need a blog title, content, possible hashtags and things like that for social media sharing, and then a headline image. So we're looking at generating some text in some different formats and also an image. So to get started in Model Garden, we have Palm 2 right here. I can navigate and search on top, so I could search language or, or pick any of the other. So if, once, if you don't know which model you wanna start with, it's great tooling to start here. There are also filters on this navigation as well. So you've got language, vision, speech, tabular data, documents, video, and you can look at, there's different tasks, classification, detection, extraction. There's all sorts of, all sorts of options to start from. Today, for this task, I know I wanna go right to Palm 2 for text. This is, this is the you know it's live. So when you come to, the, come to the model card, there's a lot of data here, and I will make it slightly bigger. I'm not expecting everyone to read this. The point is that we're providing code examples. You can go right to API code. You can go to this evaluation, so you could run your test sets against, test sets against the model. We've got overviews. We give some detail on use cases. And then we have documentation for getting started, including the command line documentation if you're gonna use Python as your, as your programming language. So for today, I'm most concerned about, let's just generate some text right away. So here's where we can do some, some prompt engineering. You'll see here, again, I'll, I'll make this slightly bigger so that everyone can see. So these are the models that are available to you as developers. Obviously, you'd pick the right API endpoint to bake into your applications. Here, you can work right with the, the latest endpoints. And so we have some experimental ones. The latest one here knows that this is, a, this is your non-version bleeding edge release. And then this 001, you know it's a stable release. So if you, if you choose to build an application on top of it, uh, it's, it's subject to our generally available terms for stable releases. Let's pick the latest version of Text Bison. Over here, there are some settings. For those of you who have been playing with this, I think some of these are gonna seem familiar. We have some new ones as well. So temperature is a measure of the creativity of the model. 
let's crank it up a little bit. We're, we're generating fun text, so let's, let's go wild. Token limit, token is about four characters, so if you wanna think about tokens, you can have, uh, these, this endpoint goes up to 8,000 tokens, and then there's this other endpoint here, which is 32,000 tokens. So these are new releases and are expanding our, our token length from the, the previous releases from before this week as well. We'll go down here, you can generate multiple responses. Two other um, very new releases as of today. So streaming, so this is, uh, these models generate tokens. And so what you want from a user experience, the latency on these models, because they're doing a lot of compute, can feel like it's a, a long latency. So you can actually see the text being written uh, each token as it gets output by the model. So it actually, the time to first token latency and the time to last token latency are very different things. So if you're looking here, if you're trying to make your users feel like the model is running faster, you enable streaming. And there's another piece right here called enable grounding. And this one's interesting, we released it, we just announced it about an hour ago. Grounding for most of you who are going to be dealing with the problem of model hallucination, there's a, there's a overall issue that these models have and this, the temperature control on the top can, helps to control that hallucination a little bit. This grounding here lets you customize against your own enterprise data. So return me an answer that's consistent with, do you have an HR manual? Do you, are you doing something internal and do you want to give the, do you want to have an HR chatbot that's the, what are my 401k contribution? What's, what's the employer match this year? Which is different than what is the IRS limit, right? That's, a, that's public data. This is your own company's data. So if you want your models to be responding with, item, with, with information that is relevant to your own company's data, this is where you go first. For today, we're gonna to do a little bit simpler version of a, of a demo. And so we won't, we won't be grounding on anything external, but I highly encourage everyone who's wondered, can we release something that's consistent with our brand guidelines? Or do we have, do we have a manual for fixing one of our fleet of vehicles? Again, I wanna answer questions against it. These are, these are all real use cases that our customers have come to us uh, with real life problems in, in how we developed uh, our grounding solution. For now, I'm just gonna cut and paste a prompt that I've developed where we want a multimedia campaign to highlight this healthy snack. So we're coming back to that original example. We've got a bunch of facts, different ingredients. If we were using grounding, maybe we'd actually have the recipe for our granola bar. We just put that into the grounding source. And also, all of our other sustainable practices. And at the end, I've just prompted for a headline, a blog post, a caption, and hashtags. And we will I have to disable grounding. There we go. Now the submit button works. So I have streaming, so you're going to see the time to first token. So it's going to be a few seconds, and then you'll just see the, the content. Oh, there we go. That's how you know it's live. We'll switch over. If I sit and talk for too long, things time out in the background too. Um, so while this one reloads, There we go. I hope the internet in here didn't stop working. You've seen all the settings. Let me wait for this one to reload, and let's talk quickly about images. So for images, we have a model called Imagine. It's one of Google's models, first P models. I'd like to make a header image. So if I click on that, It's entirely possible the internet decided to stop working just as I click submit. Can you run back your phone again? Yeah, we can hotspot off my phone. We were joking about that earlier. Um, 
let's flip back, because I know we only have a few minutes left, so let's actually, let's flip back out of the demo and let me, uh, let, let me flip back. It is, a, it is a sad state, I apologize. Um, we will, let's try one other time. Let's see, if it, let's see if it'll come up. Yeah, I'm not, we're just not getting anything at all. So, looks like we're having some connectivity issues. So, let's flip, let's flip back to the slides. Okay, thank you. I chose to do one live demo, everything else on slides. This happens. <laughs> so for this one, let's talk about a digital assistant and let's, let's decide that we're gonna start with Meta's Llama 2. So now available in Model Garden, as we said before. Um, you can open up that model card that I showed before to learn more about it. We have another button right here, Open Notebook. We released today, we've actually rebased our notebook solution to be an enterprise version of Google Colab. So it's the, the notebooks that you know and love from Colab are now directly integrated with Vertex. In here, I can click right on the deploy button. I pick the model name that I want for my endpoint, save it, and it ends up right in the Vertex model registry. From there, one more click, deploy to custom endpoint. That's how easy it is to get started with Llama 2. You can get an endpoint up in a matter of 10 or 15 seconds. But what if I wanted a more custom solution? What if I wanted to tune this model with my own data? So we've integrated model tuning with Llama 2 within, within Model Garden and right out of the box. So to do this, I go into Notebook and then I can page through the notebook so I can step through the, that fine tuning notebook and I can explore both parameter efficient fine tuning and reinforcement le learning with human feedback tuning, so RLHF. And we'll come back to those in a minute. So both tuning and deployment are done within my GCP tenant where I have full control and ownership of my data. So it's an enterprise, enterprise use case. Your data is your data. I can also perform responsible AI checks that are powered by the Vertex Content Moderation API right on the output of the tuned model. For those of you who aren't familiar with RLHF, it's one of the most powerful tuning methods out there today. For RLHF, you have two data sets. One's a preference data set that lets you train a reward model, and the other is a prompt data set with unlabeled data Think like thumbs up, thumbs down information from your users. We feed your prompt data set to the foundation model to generate outputs. And then we score the outputs with the reward model, assign a reward. We process this through the reinforcement learning step to tune the foundation model by updating the model weights using the objective to maximize the reward. At the end of the pipeline, you get a model that has learned to perform better based on this human feedback. It's one of the techniques that's showing the most promise, along with, so this one and parameter efficient tuning are the two we're seeing have the best results, and these tuning jobs are not particularly expensive. As I mentioned before, we offer enterprise controls for the models that you use in Vertex, so your data is your data. For those, of looking, for those of you looking to deploy generative AI in your companies, we've got everything that you would have expected from any other model using Vertex also works for our foundation models. We don't train with your data. We pass rigorous certifications to ensure your data remains secure, and we're committed to keeping up with the, all of the global regulation around AI. We also, as Sundar has mentioned several times, we are bold, get responsible. So we also have a wide variety of responsible AI tooling. I won't get into all of these in depth, but I mentioned that content moderation API. Think of it as knobs and knobs that you can tune uh, to restrict the outputs of your models. If you don't want the model talking politics, turn that down to zero. If you want that model to talk about 
something else like a like a health problem. So if you're if you're running a, a consulting uh, chatbot for for health issues, you can turn that up. If you don't want that, you turn it down. So we offer 16 different knobs. We have our built-in technical safeguards. We have checks to make sure your model doesn't violate copyright. And then we also have bias evaluation tooling. So our teams, our responsible AI teams have developed a pretty sophisticated set of tooling that you can test your model against many different uh, groups and we have some really differentiated data sets. Right now you'll see those are, are running in, in notebooks and we'll be progressing those directly into Vertex later this year. So the, the bottom two are not integrated yet with open source models and the top two are. So I've gone through my, my tuning step and now I'm ready to deploy. Like I said, showed before, so now you've got the tuned version of this Llama model. I can deploy it right to an endpoint. We have time for one more use case. This one's pretty near and dear to Google's heart. It's around product search. So finding the thing that you're looking for. A lot of businesses looking to help customers discover cool products or features really don't have great tooling on their websites to help that happen. So there are some cool technologies that we can combine to create some really robust product search. So in this example, say I'm the chief data scientist for a sporting goods store, and I wanna add this kind of search capability to our online storefront so that we can help our customers find what they're looking for. In this case, say I recently read about something called text embeddings. And that's very interesting. What embeddings are, are a representation of things like product descriptions, so text snippets, in a vector space. And so we can use the difference between these vectors to understand similarity. So you're reducing the text snippet into a, a number, and then you're trying to see the, how far these numbers are apart from each other. Essentially, it's a little more complicated than that. I'm not a, a vector specialist, um, but we have some good tooling out of the box to help you figure this out. It's a two-step process. First, in Model Garden, I navigate to embeddings for text in the Model Garden uh, tab, and I can go view API code. So what you're seeing here is text embeddings gecko. It's our highly performant model for embeddings. I can use this to generate embeddings, and we have some customers doing this at scale already. It's one of our most popular models. We want to pair this next with the Vertex AI matching engine, which is our managed vector database. The matching engine has built-in support for this vector similarity thing that I spoke about before, which is exactly these, these two together, so you're gonna think of embeddings plus the matching engine, together can give you a really robust and powerful product search. Couple examples. So the top ranked product for pets is table tennis rackets, XL bright color. So if you're looking for uh, to enable search for your customers, this is where I'd recommend starting. And it and it uses a generative AI model for embeddings. We also recently, probably three or four weeks ago, released an image embeddings model. So you can take the images on your websites and also reduce them into vector space and search on them. This is the start of what we think about as converging, multimodal convergence. So now I can do the search on text and I can do the search on image. So if you, if you run a retail website and you're looking to help your customers understand red dress and you don't have product descriptions for red dress, this is where I'd suggest you start. I'd start with image embeddings as well. Take a look, Model Garden. I'll stay here long enough for folks to, to take a quick picture. The generative AI studio in Model Garden, I promise your accounts will actually work right out of the box. It's only my accounts that don't work. 